Hello, my name's Sharon Claffy Kaliubi. I'm going to be chairing the video and learning. You're going to see two different styles of video and learning. We are going to start with Matt, and I'm going to introduce both speakers right at the beginning. But Matt is going to give an anecdote, a story, showing how he is using it in his uh, case study. And then we have Aunt Pugue, who is going to be telling you tips, techniques, tricks, things like that. So brief introduction on our speakers. We have Matt, who has worked at the European Astronaut Center in Cologne, um, Cologne, Germany, since 2012. He provides instructional design support for the training of astronauts, which sounds very cool, astronauts and ground support crew in relation to missions to the International Space Station. In recent years, he's actually set up um, an in-house capability to process, produce video training for the astronauts on board the ISS. And I really wanted to memorize that, but I didn't want to mess it up because it is so cool. So basically, Matt, you deal with the rocket scientists. No not, rocket scientists. Not difficult at all. Um, we then have Ant, who I just have to jump to the end to the fact that you live in Bali with your beautiful wife and daughter. And I just, that blows me away. He's able to do everything that you're seeing here remotely in that situation. Ant's a consultant. He creates um, bite-sized training videos personalized for the software and systems. Um, he has worked in L&D for over 10 years. He's used tools like Storyline and Articulate, and most recently decided to start using video <coughs> as an alternative to the delivery of um, learning information. I think it's very, very cool that we're seeing these two different sides of it, and I myself use video very much within my work environment. We utilize it with iPhones, iPads, have it self-directed, and in a studio. So I'm going to be learning just as much as all of you. So with that, Matt, I'd like to start with you. Can I oh, take a picture? he's going to take a picture of all of you. Wait a minute, you got to get me in here too. Hello. <laughs> Thank you. All right, we'll start. <clears throat> okay, so many thanks for the introduction. I've been here to the conference twice before, sitting where you guys are. So it's a great honor for me to be here now presenting. So. Many thanks for having me here and to you guys for being so supportive during the build-up. So if you've been approached and asked to set up a capability to produce any sort of video training, or you might already be beginning to actually do that, hopefully some of what I've got to talk to you about today will be of use for you because I've got some kind of uh, real-life experiences of, of um, how we went about doing it. So. What I'm going to talk about, I'm going to give you a very brief introduction to the International Space Station, or ISS, and then talk about why we use video on board, and then talk about, well, how do you get set up from nothing? How do you begin to produce video? And then um, give you some very basic sort of tips uh, from my experience at the end. So the International Space Station, or ISS, it's a manned outpost in what's called low Earth orbit. It's going around at about 250 miles above the planet. It's got a crew of six, and they stay on board for an average of six months. And their primary role is to do research in the low uh, levels of gravity which we have in low Earth orbit. So they go through a great deal of training on the ground before they get there. So a typical training flow for uh, a crew member would be something like this. You go through the selection, and then once you get taken on, you go through what's called a basic training. And the name sort of gives it away, really. It lasts about 18 months. And during this period, you learn the foundation stones of what you need to go into space. So you'll learn things like biology, medicine, astrophysics, uh, survival skills, all the fundamental things that you need. After that, you call yourself an astronaut, and you go into what's called pre-assignment training. Now, this period can be variable. It can last anything from six months up to six years, depending on your situation. And during this phase, you'll go into much more detailed training. You'll start to learn Russian. You'll start to, you'll start to learn about spacewalking or EVAs, and you'll go into more detail on the ISS itself. And you'll also be given a day job to also pass your time as well, because it can be such a long time. Once you get a mission, it's ta-da, you're going to the space station. You then go into assigned crew training, which lasts for about 24 months. And at this period, it gets really intense. 
Your time is completely planned out down to the day, ex exactly where you're going to be, what you're going to be doing, and you go into much more detail on what you're going to do in your mission. Then when you're on board, you'll also receive some onboard training, and that's mainly what I'm going to talk about here in terms of the in terms of the video which we produce to go on board. So in my role, I produce instructional design support. We still do exist. Um, so I provide support for all of these phases, but for the pre-assignment and the assigned and onboard, it's only for the European part of the space station, which is the Columbus module, which is a tiny part of the overall whole picture. So what does a crew member do when they go on board? Uh, this is Samantha. Uh, my colleague who flew, I think, back in 2015. And an astronaut's day is extremely packed. They work 10 to 12-hour days, Monday through to Friday, often into the weekends. And they're always fixing things. They're always repairing things, maintaining things, installing equipment, experiments, whatever that may be. Now, Samantha is working on what's called the Biolab, which is in the Columbus, the European part of the ISS, and she was trained on the ground in Cologne how to do this, what she, what she has to do. But a crew member doesn't do a thing without a procedure. Everything that they do uses a, um, a kind of like a task list. It's the list of instructions that they have to go through on board. Now here we see Tim Peake, and he's about to do a, um, some maintenance on something called Melfi, which is a deep freeze. And you can see he's referring here to an iPad and the list of instructions that he has to go through is on the iPad. Now, a crew member's time on board is incredibly valuable. It's the most precious resource that there is. So whatever we can do to make their time more effective and efficient, we do. And in recent years, we've started to do that by using video on board. We produce two types. We produce very, very short type uh, micro clips, less than half a minute long, and they go with the individual steps in the procedure. So they'll read the procedure, play the clip. And then we produce longer videos, five to 10 minutes long, which we call onboard training videos. And they give an overview of the entire task, and they'll watch that before they do the procedure. And so how can it help? Well, crew feedback they're always asking for more use of video. They find it very, very useful. These type of YouTube tutorial clips they find extremely useful. And I'll just share a brief clip of my colleague Tom here. I've taken off the sound, but I just wanted to show you that the contrast is all wrong, the lighting's bad. Tom had an iPhone in his pocket here to record the audio because we had no equipment. We had a little old-fashioned sort of handy cam. It wasn't HD or, or like anything. We didn't really know what we were doing in terms of making video. What we did understand was how to make training or how to make content. And so the challenge was moving from how do we do it one way to doing it in another way, and what do we need to, to, to kind of get there. We then became a little more ambitious, and we made a longer video, which was, again, taking a classroom lesson to convert it into video. And we chose how does a crew member get to and from the ISS. And one of them became quite successful. It was 20 minutes long, and everyone said, you're crazy, it's too long, people won't pay attention. But we put this onto YouTube, and I think at the time of talking to you, it's got nearly 5 million hits, and it's the most successful Easter video on YouTube. And we found out that NASA started to use it to train their crew members. So I'll just show you a brief clip where Paolo Nespoli, who's a crew member who's just come back, talks about what it's like to to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. I started looking at procedure, we did a few things, and when I looked out again, I saw that we were already uh, inside those plasma things. It was getting really red, and actually the window was getting pretty dark. Uh, what was happening that the uh, plasma stream is actually burning uh, the outside layer of the window, which has a protective cover. So it was kind of interesting. I love his comment. Oh, it's kind of interesting. But um, <laughs> So from doing this, we were kind of emboldened, as I say, and we thought we, we must be sort of doing something right. So we've gone on from there. And as a result of this, we've kind of been able to get more investment in equipment and, and what have you. But how do we sort of start? Where do we actually begin? And what would I suggest that you do if you want to just start from nothing? I would say the first thing that you need to do is to set up a team and choose a topic. The topic should be something that you really understand well. It could be a classroom lesson, it could be a piece of training that you've got planned, but choose something that you think you understand and that you can do. 
set up a team of people. You need people who are flexible, who are, who are going to kind of rise to um, challenges. You need an expert in the topic. And ask in your organization, because you might have somebody who already works with you who's very good at doing video or who's got equipment, and, and you might even be able to kind of use their camera or, or something like that. And then out of that, see what happens and design a production process. So this is a very basic kind of overview of what, you, of what we use as a production process. So obviously, underneath each one, there's a lot of sub-steps. And if you've designed courseware or if you've designed e-learning, you might think, well, this is no great shakes. This is kind of what we kind of do like anyway. But the point of the process is to transfer what you do to the new medium of video. It's very important to get organized. So in each stage here, it's an iterative process. It goes round with reviews until you come to your final product. And so what you find out of this as well is that if you then apply touch times of who is involved and how long they take, you can just apply um, project management to it to work out how long it will take and how much it will cost. So if your boss says to you, how long will it take to, to make a 10-minute video, if you apply this, if this becomes the foundation of what you have, you can use it to kind of plan effectively. One thing I would say about a script here is, is to have a clear idea of what you want. If it's short clips that you're making, you can just have like a shot list. But if you get into anything longer, I think that you need a script. And my advice to be, once you've written it, record it very roughly. It doesn't have to be good quality, but just record it. Because that will show you how long it's going to be. But it'll also show you what you need to fill all of the words. Because when you write a script, you often get overambitious. And when you get to it, you realize you've got two minutes of video, and, you, and you're talking for 10 minutes. So it, it's, a, it's a good sort of reality check. OK, so you've got your process, you've got a topic. What sort of equipment do you need? I've just made a very basic list of kind of what I think are the essentials to get started, and then the nice to haves. Some of it's obvious. You need a video camera. It sort of goes without saying. But I would say that the camera on my, on my smartphone is probably much better quality than the video camera that I was using four years ago. And what you sort of buy is up to you in terms of if you get some money, if you get some budget, buy yourself a good camera. But it's, it's subjective, and it's down to how much money that you've got to spend. Microphones are important, something like this, a uh, lapel mic if you're doing an interview, or a desktop mic if you're doing any sort of voiceover or narration. Lights are important, and you can pick up a set of lights very, very cheaply. You're also going to need a very powerful computer, lots of disk space, and I'm, and I'm talking terabytes of disk space if you, if you get into this in any way whatsoever. And of course, you're also going to need some sort of editing software. Just a quick word about sound. Sound is very important. It's more important, I feel, than the actual pictures that, that, that you see, because if it's poor quality sound, you'll kill it. Now, when we started, people were saying, you need to go out and you need to convert a classroom. You need to convert an office. You need to line it with, with, with all these kind of insulating foams, and we need to have it separate from the rest of, of the building. And I was like, can't we just use a cardboard box? And everyone sort of looked at me like I was crazy, but that's exactly what I did. I went out and I bought a canvas box from Aldi. I, I believe it costs five euros. I lined it with some, with some foam. And it produces excellent results for what we need in terms of the quality that we need. If you need studio-level sound, go out and get it. But if you're on a budget, something like this is really, really effective. Some additional equipment would be an additional camera. It's a useful thing to have if you're doing interviews, for example. To have two cameras is extremely handy because you get a different viewpoint. And if the person makes a fluff up, you can sort of cut between views. A green screen is incredibly cheap. It's just a green sheet. But if you buy one, one, one of those, you can get some really cool backgrounds to your videos. A sound recorder such as this, I had no idea what that was four years ago. But it's a very useful tool to record your, your um, audio directly into. And you can also use it as a microphone. And then a teleprompter such as this one, it's kind of like an auto cue. This one here, you, you just attach it onto the um, end of a camera, and you place like an iPad or a tablet, and it sort of plays it back. And if you want to know why that's important, this is me four years ago just trying to say two paragraphs from memory. Master is part of the phases project. Invest. No. Okay. The No. Okay. You, you, you have to start somewhere. But um, that was all fun and games at the time, but it was actually extremely annoying, and it took a long time. And if you have a teleprompter or, or something like that, it, it would have overcome that issue there. But you know, that's just how it is. I didn't get any better with the teleprompter. But, um, and now some just some quick lessons learned. 
And what I mean by these are just some practical things when you actually start to make a video. I would say that you need to allow time to set up when you're filming. You have to be organized. You need to allow time. If we're, if we're going to record an astronaut or crew member do an interview with them, they might have 10 minutes, and that's it, because their time is so important. So we have to be ready. You might have people coming to your place from a different organization to record something or film something. So you have to be ready for them to not waste their time. And out of that comes checking everything and being prepared. We've made like a checklist, much like a pilot's list of kind of what you go through. So check that your sound's working, check that your white balance is OK, check that everything's in focus, that you've got enough disk space, all of that. You really need to be prepared. And then film much more than you think you need. This is very, very crucial, particularly if you're going to do any sort of technical training. The mistake is to film something once and then to go back. If you go back to your sort of office and then you find out someone's put their thumb over the key part, it's a problem. So film something from multiple different views, angles, zoom factors, everything else, and then you'll cover yourself, hopefully, and you won't have to do any sort of um, reshoots. And then the last bit, show only what is necessary, tell a logical story. I think from my experience of training, I think one of the problems when technical people try to um, explain anything or give training is they, they, they tell too much. We give too much information because it's, in, it's important to the technical person, so it must be important to everyone else. One of our challenges in training crew members is that they're, they're very um, sharp people, their time is limited, and we have to be very honing in on the message that we want to give people. So really, really think, is what I'm telling them necessary, or is it just fluff? And just get rid of the fluff and home in what you really need. And then tell a logical story. If we're doing a video about an experiment, it'll usually go through the same sort of process. It'll be, what is the experiment? Why are we doing it? What are the benefits? What are the components? And then what do you have to do? And so focus on your audience and what their needs are. It's the same with any training or courseware or anything. And you just apply it to, to this and tell a logical story, and then you'll take people with you. So this is the procedure you saw earlier for something called Arthrospear. And I'm just going to show you a clip which went up to the space station about four weeks ago. And it's no great shakes. It's not exciting, don't get me wrong. But, but what it shows is it just shows how you can turn things which take a long time to explain in words into something very, very visual. So it's opening a box, basically. That's what it is. But um, like the, um, the, the text has to be very clear. And you can use little techniques such as speeding up um, the film speed so that what would take a long time, that took half a minute to do. And, and you can just like, make it seem like um, you, you can just show things um, not in sort of like real time. And so that went up to the space station, I think, back in January. And the feedback on that one was that it was very effective in, in helping the, the crew member do what they have to do. And you just have to sort of concentrate on the angles and the viewpoints that you take. So to film that, I think we spent the afternoon doing the filming. And then all of the cutting and everything else, um, did, that didn't take so long. So what's the future for kind of video trading in, in, in terms of space and in terms of work with you guys? NASA are trying to kind of cut the, the training time for crew members. You saw at the beginning sort of how long it takes. So they're trying to reduce training time. And there's a move to doing more training on board. So this just-in-time training or what have you is becoming more useful. And um, it will continue to be so with video. And as we move beyond the ISS and we're starting to look at going to the moon and to Mars, those sort of missions are going to be much longer duration. And so you're going to have to do more training on board and video will, bec will become an a cheap way of kind of d doing that be because cost is always important. So for you, what I would say my message would be, would, would, would be to um, <coughs> choose something that you think you can do, set up a team, and have a go. And out of that, design a production process which suits you and how you work because that's what's going to be important, and because that will become the foundation of what you do. You don't have to rush out and buy lots of expensive equipment at the beginning. You just have to kind of make do, because you probably won't be given the budget to actually do that. But if you can prove yourself by producing something which is effective, people are more likely to say, OK, now you can have a camera, now you can have this, and what have you. And for me, I think being involved in this has been one of the most fun things that, that I've done. And it's been very, very enjoyable. And so what I would say to you guys is, is to, if you're going to do it, have fun doing it. Go out there, have fun, and um, make some good videos. Thanks very much. That's the, that's the end. Thank you, Matt.
Um, what we'd like you to do is take a minute now, just while Ant gets ready to set his stuff up. Uh, we're going to take questions at the end. Thanks. So sometimes it's hard to keep it in the back of your mind. Just write down your questions that you might have for Matt. We'll do that at the very end, and that'll give Ant time to get set up. So take a moment and do that. Hello. Can I just start, or are we doing something? I missed, I missed what you said. Okay. I lost the contact lens about an hour before this uh, talk, so I can only see this half of the room. <laughs> okay. Right. Well, I'll crack on then, and if you've got any questions for Matt, we'll we'll talk about those at the end. Um, thanks for the introduction, and well done from uh, well done from uh, a good presentation from Matt. I'm going to bring you back down to earth with a bump now. Um, so I'm going to be talking about using uh, video to create high impact content. What I want to kind of do is dovetail Matt's presentation a little bit. He's given you kind of a story of, of how it can be used in his organization. And what I want to do is really talk about some of the different techniques that you can use and different styles of videos that you might want to think about using um, if you're creating content in your, uh, in your business. So I'm going to take you back and give you a bit of context. This was me back in 2002 when I graduated university. I had a lot more hair on my head than I did on my chin back then. Um, but my first job after graduating was working as a software trainer. So I was actually teaching the software that I learned how to use at university. And I would stand in front of classrooms and teach you know, different software. And uh, I did a, two or three different jobs in that kind of field. But it was very much classroom based. Um, and that's where I kind of learned, you know, I knew how to use a software, but that's where I learned, you know, how to teach, essentially. And, and I felt that that was a, you know, a very important skill that I've, that I've ho hopefully, you know, developed and honed over the last sort of 20 years of doing this. Um, but the reason I wanted to mention this is because this led me on to my dream job, which was on board one of these things. Hands up if you've ever been on a cruise ship. Oh, not many. Okay, just a few hands. Well, for those of you who haven't, um, this is MV Ventura, which is a, uh, a British cruise ship um, owned and managed by P&O Cruises. Uh, and I was employed as a trainer to work on board one of these cruise ships. And my job was to teach computer lessons. And you might think to yourself, well, why would you need computer lessons on board a cruise ship? Well, when these cruise ships are away at sea, sometimes they're sailing for like five, six, seven days in a row and you don't get to sort of see any dry land. So there's a lot of activities for the passengers. The demographic for this cruise ship was between 60 and 70. So they were a little bit older, and therefore, and this was kind of, what, 15 years ago. So they hadn't really had the opportunity to use technology in maybe their careers. And so we did different classes, things like how to use eBay, how to trans this one was how to remove red eye from your photos, how to transfer photos from your camera to your computer. We did how to build your family tree on a computer, that kind of thing. So anything to do with technology, really. And it was, it was great. I, I really enjoyed it. It was a really good opportunity to learn how to, you know, to teach stuff in plain English. Um, and I always remember one lesson. We, our, our very beginner's computer class was called Computers for the Terrified. And it was <laughs> for absolute beginners, so people who didn't have a clue how to use computers. And I, I remember at the start of the first lesson, I said, right, Everyone, move your mouse around on the screen and, and click on Internet Explorer or something, and obviously you know what's coming. One guy that sat at the front actually picked his mouse up, and he was moving his mouse around on the screen like that. I had another guy who was actually trying to remote control his mouse on the screen. So I had to take a step back and rethink how I was teaching, because what was obvious to me wasn't necessarily obvious to my audience. Anyway, to cut a long story short, this was... Um, Really exciting for me. I, was, I felt like I was making a difference. I mean, I, I know it sounds a bit of a kind of cliche, but I was helping people do things that they didn't, they'd never done before. But one of the biggest challenges and one of the biggest objections that I had from people doing these types of classes was that they'd get home and they'd forget everything they learned. And I'm sure you've, you know, you've heard that before. And so what I started doing was, and you can see under that chap's left elbow is a DVD. And what I started doing was making videos of this training. And it started really simply, uh, literally very similar to what Matt, Matt described. I, I was doing my classroom training, and I would literally put a camera at the back of the room, like this chap at the back here, and I would press record before I started training. I would do my training session, press stop, and I'd run down to my cabin, not, not literally there and then, but I'd go down to my cabin and then deliver the, the DVDs to the passengers' cabins so that they had something to take away, and they could at least 
go home and watch that training again when they got home. And the, the quality was terrible, you know, exactly the same as Matt described. I didn't have a microphone. These poor people had to watch a DVD with me walking around the classroom and helping people. When the ship tilt, tilted over, people going like this. <laughs> you know, it was, it was a bit, it was very amateurish. But this was my first exposure into putting training onto video. And it really whet my appetite because I, I, I saw that at this point, rather than just talking to 15 people, you know, I could get my message out to, to 150 people or 10,000 people or 100,000 people. There was no limit once you created that content. There was no limit on, on who could see this. And I mean, this was what, like 12 years ago. So YouTube was kind of probably just hanging around and getting started. Um, but back then, we were doing DVDs. And I really saw the opportunity there. So I kind of went full circle a bit with my career. And I started, I got a bit, I would say, distracted by some of the interactive tools. And I, I've actually. I've done at least one project with each one of these tools that you can see here. And I think I got a little bit throughout my career, I got a little bit distracted by all the different <laughs> interactive tools that are available. I'm sure you guys have used many of these tools, and there are other interactive tools that you've used in the past to create e-learning or e-learning content. And I, I very much went down that route. I went down the, the learning designer route, creating content, storyline, captivate, um, all these different, well, before storyline, it was articulate, uh, what was it called? Studio, thank you. And I have to be really careful what I say here, guys, because I've got two of the world's top storyline developers looking right at me here. I can only see Nate's because of my contact lens. But, um, but I definitely got distracted by the power of these tools. And I kind of lost my way a little bit. And I kind of forgot that what I was trying to do here with creating uh, learning content, on or e-learning, essentially, was to have uh, an impact on, on performance and, and help people learn to do something. And I think. I, I'm not, I'm not um, for one second saying that that's what learning designers do, but I think it's easy to get distracted by the, the technology and the software, create these wonderful courses in these interactive tools, and forget that actually further down the line, imagine if you're floating around in a pa uh, space station, um, you're not going to be able to dig out the answer in an articulate storyline course, no matter how mobile, responsive, and optimized it is. So I've kind of come full circle, and I've come back to video in the last three or four years and realized that actually, I think you know, video is a, a really exciting tool that we can use. Um, and I'll just mention this before I go on to talk about the techniques. Um, the reason I, I just talked about that, we look at the, the learner journey. And this is, I think, called the performance support infrastructure. If you Google that, you'll find a bit more detail around this slide. But the first phase of a performance support infrastructure, or the learner journey, is to do that initial training where you're teaching something, something to somebody for the very first time. So that would be your classroom training, your face-to-face -face training, your e-learning, your storyline course, which is great. And I think storyline and those tools are brilliant for that. But I think where those tools fall down is they're not that useful when you go further through that journey. And as we just saw, video is great if you're floating around in a, a space station. And that's what I was finding with my computers for the terrified. It would be great for delivering that classroom training. I could stand in front of an audience and deliver that training. But once they got home, I wasn't there. I couldn't help them. So video was actually useful. And my point I wanted to make is I think video can be useful throughout this whole journey and not just you know, for delivering that, that training up front. So I'm going to whiz through 10 techniques for creating video content. This is useful regardless of whether you've got a big budget, small budget, you're doing it yourself. Um, I think there are ways to work around this. And it, a lot of it's creativity and using your imagination. Um, but I, I'll go through these techniques, and I'll, I know we're not, not got loads of time, so I'll try and, uh, try and go through them relatively quickly. Matt already talked about recording live training, but I think this is a brilliant way to get started. If you haven't got a big budget and you haven't got a huge team of storyline developers or course developers or you know, you've just got limited time, recording live training is a great way to get started. Now, the way I did it on my cruise ship was plonking a video camera at the back of the classroom, standing at the front and recording. That's the most basic thing you can do. And yes, you can do it with an iPhone, or you can buy a bit more of an expensive camera. Um, it's a great way to start, but the quality won't be great. So the first thing you can do is invest in a lavalier microphone. Matt touched on it. There's two different types. You can get the, one, the ones that are wired, just like this one I've got here, actually. Oh, sorry. Just like this one I've got here, it can be connected to, well, this one's a wireless, actually. It's connected to a receiver, which is attached to my pocket. And the other part of this receiver is attached to the camera. So as we're filming this video, you're going to have one video file, which makes editing really easy, because you've just got that one video file. It's got high quality audio. I can walk around the classroom. I can go over and talk to people as I'm teaching. And I'm, I'm co co collecting or um, gathering that high quality audio. 
the other, the other one I wanted to mention is a, a wired uh, microphone. These wireless ones cost about 500 pounds, which if you're going to create a lot of video is, a, is a definitely a good investment. Uh, the, I bought one off eBay for, that plugs into my iPhone, and I just put my iPhone in my pocket, talk into my microphone, and I got my camera separate, and then I sync the video and the audio together after. That cost me 25 pounds off eBay, and it was, it's brilliant quality. So you don't have to spend a lot of money. Uh, again, Matt touched on it. I'm butchering your presentation here. Different camera angles. So if, imagine if we were filming me here for two hours talking. It would be pretty boring for the viewer, no matter how high quality the, the audio is. If we put two more cameras either side of the room, the, ed, the person who's editing the video could actually cut to those other, other camera angles and make it a lot more interesting, just having you know, dif different sides of the, the person talking. Screen recording. If any of you use Camtasia or ScreenFlow, yeah, a few hands. We use Camtasia all the time now. Obviously, what we do with Video Bytes is create software training. Um, but Camtasia, you can hit record on your presentation on your computer before you start talking. And then you've not only got your camera at the back, your camera's at the side. You've also got your screen capture as well, which you can layer on top of the, the audio and the video that you've got. And if you press record on everything at the same time, you just don't have any synchronizing to do. It's all you know, two hours of footage. You've got all that content. And you can just cut back and forth between the different camera angles and the screen. So it really enhances the quality of what you're creating. Now, you're probably saying, well, we don't have video editing capability in-house, or it takes ages to edit video. Yes. I actually put a video on my YouTube channel, which I'll put details of this at the end. Um, it's really easy to outsource your video editing these days. There's a website. Have any, any of you ever used a website called Upwork? One hand, two hands. You might have, have any of you heard of Upwork? OK. You've probably heard of freelancer marketplaces. If you don't have resource in-house to do video editing, you can go on these websites. It's a bit like eBay, but rather than posting a you know, pair of old jeans to sell, you post your job. And you say, right, I've got 20 hours of video footage. I need somebody to edit this into one hour of video footage, put some nice music at the front, chop back and forth between the camera angles, um, put some nice titles on there, whatever it is you need. And you get people to bid on that project. And then you can just stick your files on Dropbox. They can download it onto their computer, edit the video for you, send it back. And you've got a perfectly nicely edited piece of content there. And you don't need to do all that yourself. And you can build up a relationship with that person. You can do a, a really sort of, sort of thorough qualification process to make sure you're getting the right person to do the job. But a lot of these developing countries these days have very cheap labor. And you can find people who are willing to do that work for a fraction of what it would take if you were going to recruit somebody as a full-time contractor internally in the UK or in Europe, America, that kind of thing. And then the fifth tip would be to chop that down into a bite-sized structure. So if you've got two hours of video footage, break that down into five, 10-minute videos. And you've suddenly got a library of content that you can upload to your LMS, you can put on YouTube, you can host. I mean, hosting is, is a whole other game. And I've got another video, actually, on my YouTube channel that talks about how you know, places that you can host your video content once you've created it. But you've gone from create, you know, a really crappy piece of video, which is just somebody standing in front of a classroom, to a really polished, high quality uh, piece of learning material there. Now, presenter-led training is slight, it kind of is the same thing. But if you take away the classroom part of it, you can do what Matt did. And you've got lights, you've got a camera. And you get somebody in front of that camera. It doesn't need to be in a studio. This example I'm going to show you now is just in front of a bookcase. Um, you don't need a script. I, I, I don't know if Matt mentioned a teleprompter. Um, but my personal opinion for recording live videos is not to use a script because it feels scripted. And if you've got the expert on camera talking, unless it's a, an actor, if you've got the presenter talking and he's the expert, you don't need a script because he knows everything that he needs to say in his head. And this, in this example, you'll see that this person, he is the expert. He's talking. It cuts from scene to scene. It looks natural. It wasn't you know, hours and hours of doing shoot after shoot to get it perfect. I had just had a good, good run of projects. projects. The kind of thing where you're like, man, I am enjoying this work. It's going really well. I'm proud of the stuff that I'm putting out there. It's getting done in the right amount of time. And then disaster struck. I had a string of projects to do. So I did my little time estimation and said, OK, so this one's going to take about that long. And then this one's going to take about uh, that long. And then this one's going to take about that long. The only problem was this one didn't take that long. So you can see it was very relaxed, very engaging. He wasn't using a script. He prop I've actually watched a video that t tells you how he made that. And what he did is he had his laptop underneath the camera with his bullet points on of what he wanted to cover. And he looked down. He's like, right, the first thing I want to talk about is project length. So he looks at the camera, starts talking. He made a mistake, did it again, just got it until he got it right. 
And then he looked down, and he got the next point. Right, I'm going to talk about that. And then when you go into the editing phase, you just chop that bit out. It's very easy to do. So that's another style. And you could see that was with some studio lights. Uh, you can buy, I bought some studio lights on Amazon, uh, a company I used to work for. Um, it was about £100 off Amazon for the, some of those kind of studio lights with the umbrellas. Brilliant quality. Those either side of the camera. You've got your lavalier microphone and an iPhone or whatever camera you're going to use, and you're away. Very, very low budget, but high. You know, if you're looking at a minute by minute ratio of how much it costs to create a content, content like that versus creating content with, you know, Storyline or some of these interactive tools, you're looking at a much lower amount of time to create this type of content. Recorded webinars. Now, that's you know, a very, very low-budget way of doing that. But if you've got no time to set up a studio and umbrellas and cameras and stuff, but you've got experts within your business who are, you know, they have the knowledge in their heads about products, services, technology, whatever it is that they're talking about, you can get them to host webinars. And it could just be 20 minutes long. It doesn't have to be an hour, an hour and a half, two hours. 20-minute webinar, talk about their expertise, all the, conference material, uh, all the conference software these days has the facility to record it. So click, get them to click record, record their webinar, it exports it into a video file, and then you could break that down into bite-sized chunks. You could put titles on there, and you could make it a bit smarter, and then put that onto your learning management system. That's even more content that you can create. Just very low budget, quick, um, easy, to, easy to do. Uh, at the company I used to work at, we did that. The, uh, the, sales, the sales team, essentially, were delivering products and services training um, and they were doing it kind of uh, internally and via WebEx. We just got them to do it on webinar and, and recorded it, and we put that up onto the LMS, and they didn't need to keep doing it over and over again. We just had that material there as, as a library of footage. <coughs> Recorded presentations with voiceover. So th these are all very similar, essentially, but rather than actually having a, um, somebody in front of the camera, you could create a nice presentation. The presentation I'm going to show you now is created with entirely out of PowerPoint. Um, so using shapes, get rid of the bullet points, get rid of the corporate feel. Um, the guy who made this actually put, I think he has a course on Udemy which shows you how to use PowerPoint to make kind of animations and stuff. But I'll just show you a clip of this because it's quite interesting. I want to introduce myself in what better way than to give you a ton of fun facts about yours truly. I graduated in 2012 from Virginia Tech where I was a slightly below average pool player. I, like all kinds of cats, but of course my favorite are fat cats and Christmas hats. I had a dream once that I was heading to slay a vicious dragon, but when I got to the castle, it was a fire-breathing Nicki Minaj. So, silly example, but it was all created in PowerPoint. So you could create a really kind of sexy PowerPoint presentation. That was a professional voiceover, so yes, you can do it yourself if you've got the equipment, but I use a website called voices.com, which is brilliant. You upload your script, and within you know, two or three days, they send you back the, you, know, you choose your voice, accent, male, female, you want it energetic, fun, relaxed, professional. They send you back the, the audio files within a couple of days, and you can pop that onto your presentation. If you want to do it yourself, obviously, that's a lower budget way of doing that. Screencasting. So this is what we do at Video Bytes, is we uh, specifically focus on software and systems training. So if you have people within your organization, or customers maybe, that need to use um, a piece of software, or a system, or a web platform, or an app, um, and want to create videos around how to do that, that's essentially what screencasting is. And I'm just going to show you an example of one that we recently um, did for one of our clients. It's just got a little animated introduction that was built in After Effects, Adobe After Effects. And it's just using Camtasia. Um, some different effects and animations, and this was with a professional voiceover using that website I just mentioned. So we found the voice that we wanted to use. We've do, we're doing about 40 videos in three different languages for this client. Um, <coughs> wrote, wrote the scripts, wrote the storyboards. If you need to add additional users to your account, such as company or read-only administrators, go to the User tab at the top left of your account and click Create. In this example, we're logged into Rico's account. Rico is the quality control manager at PNK Works. Rico needs to give Rasi account access. Rasi is in the buying team at PNK Works, and she needs to check that all of. I won't put any more of that on, but you can see the concept, and I'm sure some of you have made those before. You can do that yourself really easily. So if it's not, if you don't need something that's really high quality for customers to see, for example, and you need something that's just useful for staff to see internally or to share that information internally. Obviously, you can use uh, tools like Camtasia, ScreenFlow are the ones you can buy, but there are free screen, screencasting um, tools out there that you can download as well. 
Whiteboard videos, I'm sure you've all seen these online, uh, on, on uh, TV as well. In the last few years, these have become quite mainstream. My advice with whiteboard videos is to you know, not overuse them, because it can become a bit tiresome to, to watch a whole uh, long feature length film with a whiteboard video. Um, but these are, I think these are great to replace kind of the standard flip chart. So if you want to describe a process, or you want to describe a, a procedure, or uh, some kind of flow chart, a whiteboard video can be great for this. I'll just show you a clip of one that I quite like that I found online. G'day. A boomerang has a flat side and an aerodynamic side, just like an aeroplane wing. So place the flat side against the palm of your hand and hold the boomerang like a gun. Great. Now, go outside and with the wind on your left cheek, Raise the arm holding the boomerang as if you're trying to scratch your back. Aim at one o'clock and throw the boomerang at a 45 degree angle from your target. But don't throw it sideways because it'll come back like a heat seeking missile. And if you want more rotation, snap your wrist as you throw. Okay, time to give it a try. And remember that a boomerang that doesn't come back is called a stick. <laughs> so that one was created with a piece of software called VideoScribe. Has anyone used that before? Have you heard of it? VideoScribe. Yeah, yeah. It's a really easy piece of software to use. I'm not. This is this. These techniques that I'm talking to you about are, uh, are all something that you can pretty much do yourself. With VideoScribe, you drag and drop shapes into your timeline. So you say, right, I want a picture of a boomerang. I want a picture of a man. I want some text on the screen. You type your text in. I want them to appear in this order. I want this to stay on screen for five seconds. This to stay on screen for two seconds. Then I want the camera to pan down here. I want to add some voiceover, add some didgeridoo in the background. And you can create really, really cool little video. I mean, we, we could, you know, that's only like, what, 30, 40 seconds long. You could create little videos like that that are great to introduce projects or uh, great, as I said, to, to talk about procedure or flowchart or. Uh, process and I think you know they're really really easy to use. Video scribes, I think it costs twenty pound a month uh, to subscribe to that software. So if you haven't used that before, give that a go. Explainer videos again, we'll have all seen these on TV. Um, the more kind of sexy ones, I'll show you an example now. Uh, a little bit higher budget, so this one would be built in Adobe After Effects, which obviously you need quite advanced uh, technical skills to use. But there are some really cool, um, cheap, easy to use. Um, animated explainer video style um, tools out there now. Uh, a couple called Powtoon, Go Animate, they're two of the most uh, sort of commonly used ones. And you can create this type of explainer video relatively easy. This is the story of a nonprofit called Hooks and Patches. They started with just a few people and the idea to give a helping hand for those in need. That idea became a plan, the plan became an action and the action became a cause. But Hooks and Patches had such big dreams that they soon realized they needed a little help to grow, reach more people, and raise the money they needed. That's where we came in. OK, so you can see the concept, and I'm sure you've all seen these before. Um, obviously, creating a whole training course with that type of material would be extremely expensive and unlikely to do that. But you could do just you know, a one-minute introduction like that, and then you move into your classroom training, which you've done all with your posh editing that we talked about. Or, you know, and I think I go on, I, I won't reveal, but in a moment, I'm going to talk about the, the key for, for all of these things that I'm telling you about is really using the combination of these. Because at the end of the day, you're watching a video. How you create that video is irrelevant. And the, the viewer doesn't really care you know, whether it's classed as an explainer video or a whiteboard video or if it's been filmed with a video camera. They just see a video. They click play, and they watch it from start to end. But once you've picked up a couple of these techniques, you can start combining them together. And what that does is it really brings out kind of um, well, it really maximizes what you're doing with the, the, the different techniques. And you're keeping the viewer on their toes. Because yeah, watching a one-hour explainer video would be boring. But watching a one-hour video which combines all these different aspects would actually be, I, I think, really interesting. Uh, I just wanted to briefly mention interactive video. Um, I did, I did deliver the same presentation in Learning Technologies in Singapore last year, and I had a lot of questions at the end about interactive video. I've never built anything with interactive video, but I have done a bit of, bit of digging around about it, because I, it's something that's really interesting to me. So an interactive video, the way I describe it is a little bit like, did any of you read those books when you were younger? I used to read these action, like adventure books, and I used to get to page, end, end of the chapter, and it would say, if you want to go through the blue door, 
turn to page 27. If you want to go through the red door, turn to page 36. And you go down and you, you choose which way you went. And it was like, you know, you're choosing the, the scenario that you went down. And an interactive video is like that. You get to the end of a, a video clip and you have a decision to make based on the inter information you've just um, seen. So I've got an example to show you. And this example was created just with a video camera. I mean, it's got some little effects and stuff, but it was just with a video camera and it's hosted on YouTube. So there's no clever technology there that you need to use to, you know, to have some kind of interactive platform. It's just using you know, free, free tools that we have avail available to us. Morning, mate. How's it going? Need to put a pocket money in. All right, here's uh, 40 bucks. How's that sound? All right, have a good day. So this bit now, this is YouTube, and if you use YouTube, you'll know that when you get to the end of the video, you get all options to click on another video, and all they've done is they've chosen which of your options you can click on. So I'm going to click on buy the drone. Good choice. You won't regret owning a drone. Oh, that's only forty dollars. You're eight hundred and sixty dollars short. Go around the back. My brother does loans. He'll be able to give you nine hundred dollars. Pretty standard stuff. Just sign here and the $900 is all yours. where you started but you know you, I, I'm sure light bulbs are going off in your heads now thinking how can you use this in your business to you know bring a bit more of an exciting use, uh, learner experience to to your staff and, and to your your um, customers vlogs I'm sure you've all heard the word vlog before it stands for video blog it's the video version of a, a blog or sorry it should be video log obviously uh, but vlogs uh, Everywhere on YouTube now, if you've gone to YouTube, you've probably heard of famous vloggers like Casey Neistat and Gary Vaynerchuk are two of the, the, the biggest ones I've heard of anyway. Um, but vlogging is just literally grabbing a camera and filming yourself. And I'm going to show you an example uh, of a vlog. You know, there are thousands or well, tens of thousands of them out there. This is just one example. This is one that I watch every day because I find it really interesting. This week is going to be an intense week. I've spent the whole weekend thinking about redoing the pricing of Prospero. I've shared with you last week that we're thinking about reducing our prices and I've spent the whole weekend writing documents about pros and cons and trying to clarify my thinking and I think that I reached the conclusion that we should do it. I'll tell you more about this later on today. But now some of these right videos now, are like two minutes long, sometimes they're 20 minutes long, but this guy puts a video on YouTube every single day. So he's like literally recording himself uh, and you know you might think well isn't that a bit boring well it obviously it depends you know it depends on what he's talking about but if you think about how you could use this in the workplace for example if it was your first day on a new job wouldn't it be fantastic to watch 10 day in the life videos of 10 people who work in the office you're about to work at so you can not only see what they're doing at their desk but maybe see them going to the coffee machine and they can say oh you know this is Brenda who works in the canteen and you know go back to their desk and you, know, you get a kind of real life experience and I think this kind of real life um, use of video, I think, is, is really powerful. Okay, running out of time, but that was my last tip. My last tip was actually that the best technique is to use a combination, but I've always, already sort of said that, so I won't go into any more detail about that yet. But I think, yeah, using a combination of this, this type of video content can be really powerful, and obviously some of them take longer than others, some of them take a bigger budget than others, um, some of them take more expertise to use the tools than others, um, but as Matt said as well, you know, I. I think this can be a really powerful way to deliver content, really flexible as well. Um, I just wanted to briefly mention about hosting, because obviously you can host videos on your LMS, you can host videos on YouTube and platforms like that, but I think there's also very creative ways that we can deliver video content. Um, a couple of suggestions that I've been thinking about a lot recently, one is by automated email. So rather than delivering a video where the, the learner is clicking on the video and in control of you know, when they're watching each video, you could send drip-fed emails out to learners, and over a period of, let's say, 10 days, they could re receive a new email, which has a video in each email or an, a link to an, a video in each email, and over the space of a couple of weeks, they might receive 
you know, five, 10 emails, and that talks them through a, a kind of process, so that could be good for onboarding. Have any of you heard of a, an app called uh, Typeform or Wufu or any of these online questionnaire forms? Yeah, well, you can embed videos in those now as well. So if you haven't got an LMS, but you want to kind of add, ask questions or ask for feedback about the videos that people are watching, you could put up a type form, really, really slick um, interface, ask a, play a video, ask a question, and that's got the ability to take you down different scenarios, different paths as well, takes you to another video, watch that, answer a question. So these are all different ways that we can host and deliver this, this video content. And I, and I think that's the power of video, is it, it's extremely flexible. Um, I should mention that, you know, I've, I've mentioned YouTube a few times. Um, YouTube has a feature to list your videos as unlisted, which means that nobody can find them unless they type in the exact link, the URL, which is extremely unlikely unless you send it to them. So if you've got any kind of security concerns, obviously it's not completely secure, but if you just want the mainstream, you know, if you don't want it to show up in the search engines, that's a good way of doing that. If you're interested in finding out more about what I've been talking about, I do post a lot of these. I've got my own vlog. I post my own tutorial videos on my uh, own YouTube webpage. So my username is YouTube Mr. Ant Pew. And if you're interested in learning more about the bite-sized video service, which is called Video Bytes, uh, that's at videobytes.co. This website's got quite a big resource center, which talks a lot about not just creating video for software, but creating video for training, develop, uh, learning and development in general. So things like how to write, how to write scripts for training videos. How to, where to host your training videos, that kind of thing. So, so obviously go and check that out if you're interested in that. And that's it for me, so thank you very much. So we're going to get to the questions now. I did want to mention something in regard to even my experience coming from a bank. Utilizing a script is mission critical especially when it's focused products, strategies, things like that. So I do think you have to take into account the environment in which you're delivering the learning through the video. Also, the interactive video, or what we would call scenario-based uh, learning. We utilized a great vendor. We created great scenarios up. And out of 2,500 people, we could only get it looked at by 70 to 80 people. So it, it just bombed because our culture, not because of the video, not because... So have an awareness of your culture as well in regard to video and learning. Be realistic and don't be afraid to make mistakes. With that in mind, i um, like to pose the first question to you, Matt, in regard to copyright. I know that was a real important thing. And what does that mean in regard to video in your, in your mind? Uh, <clears throat> um, well... I think it's just something to be aware of. When we were making the video about re-entering the atmosphere and getting back to Earth, we wanted to show a clip of a surfer um, to, because the technical guy thought it would be a good way to kind of illustrate that if, as the ship comes in, it's kind of like riding a wave and it to do with angles. Too technical for me. And we found a clip on YouTube. It was owned by Red Bull. And, um, it was a nightmare trying to get the use of a clip. It was like six seconds long, this clip, and trying to get the permission to use this clip. I had to phone up all people in Red Bull and everything else, and they were saying, you can't use it, you can't do it. And eventually they, they, they allowed it, but you just have to be very, very careful what you do with copyright. And um, we kind of breach it every day when we sort of download things off of uh, Google and put them into our PowerPoints and what have you. I haven't done that. But, um, but you just have to be very, very careful that what, what, whatever you use, you're not um, um, in breach of a person's copyright. So, and if, if you know that you are, just make sure that you check with the person because it might, it might be used internally, but you never know. It might find its way out into the, into the outside world, and that's when you just never know what might happen. Okay, so we're going to go with questions. I'm going to ask you to wait till I get to you so that we can record your question. And if it's not stated clearly, we might just repeat it just so we can get it on video. First question. Ooh, okay. I'm going to try to come over. I'm just going to do this easier, and then I'll get to you guys as well. Hi there. Thanks for the talk. It was very good. Um, I, what, I use Netflix on my phone if I'm like, on the tube or anything like that. And I wouldn't watch it if there wasn't subtitles on the video because how noisy it is. And I start thinking of my users, when it comes to videos, they're probably not watching them in work. They're probably watching them on their commute or anything like that. Were subtitles mentioned and how important do you think they are or do you think they will be going forward when it comes to video learning? If I could just answer that one quickly and then you can go. Um, 
for the videos we put on YouTube, we actually did them, we actually made them, and we made them in lots of languages, because I guess we were lucky that where, where I work, we got diff about 12 different nationalities, so we were able to get them in all different languages. But we found it was actually very important to actually, um, and they're, they're incredibly easy to create, and they appear automatically. So I would definitely do them at least in English, but if you can do them in other languages, yeah, sure. Yeah, and the only thing I would add to that, uh, you think that's what you're saying, is that with YouTube, when you upload a video, there's a feature in YouTube that automatically trans uh, transcribes the audio, as long as it's clearly spoken, into text. And then you, you can go in and edit it if it's wrong. And there's another service that I've used a lot, which is great, called rev.com, R-E-V.com. And you can send them a video clip or an audio clip, and they will transcribe that, and it costs a dollar a minute. So if you've got a 20-minute video, they will have some physical human being transcribing it at twenty dollars, which and it's it's ninety nine percent accurate. They might occasionally spell a name or something wrong, but it's brilliant. So yeah, I, I know that doesn't answer your question about what I see the future being, but I'm not sure to be honest. I mean, I think yeah, that situation is brilliant because you can watch a video, but I mean, out of interest, why don't you just put your headphones on when you're watching Netflix? I, I, I on the tube, it's too noisy. You can still hear oh, really? the headphones. Yeah. As well. you still, you still yeah. Unless I need a new crowd. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> Hi, thanks. I have a question to both of you. What's your policies on when to use background music, and do you have any sources for very, very subtle background music that can be used to not distract people even when they're doing technical things? Okay, so I use a website called Epidemic Sound Player. Um, it's amazing. It's got the. It's not, like I hate kind of cheesy corporate music because it's nothing worse than watching a video that's just got this like annoying kind of lift music. So that website's great because it's got proper modern music and people make the music for videographers. Um, I think less is more. Um, don't overdo it. Make sure if you're good, if you're not sure about the balance, make sure the voice is louder. It's nothing worse than listening to somebody's voice but you can't hear it because. Uh, there's some music in the background and it's a bit loud. If you're going to choose music while somebody's speaking, try and find music that doesn't have a vocal because that can interrupt. So just kind of, you know, some, some, some sort of music that doesn't um, clash with the, the audio. Uh, sorry, yeah, with the voiceover. Um, but yeah, I actually like that. I think it's really good having some subtle music because I think it really makes it feel a bit more professional. Again, it depends. If you've got a two-hour training session, I wouldn't put music throughout the whole thing, but if it's just a, you know, it could be the first couple of minutes, introduction, explain a video, whiteboard video, yeah, it's great. What was the name of that Epidemic Sound Player. Okay. Uh, at the first of the presentation, we have seen that you were talking about articulate design or articulate studio, but you didn't mm -hmm. talk about it at all. <laughs> What happened to that? So, just to repeat the question, I think, did you, did you ask why I didn't talk about storyline? Yes, in uh, because in high impact video, so you are not going to use that. Because you can embed video there and you put, so you don't use it for your work? Yeah, I don't, I, I, I have created a lot of storyline stuff in the past, uh, but I, I'm moving away from it now because I feel like storyline well, you know, if, you, if you're hosting Storyline, I mean, obviously you can create HTML5 versions of the content, but you're a little bit restricted to where that can be hosted, right? You've got to put it in your LMS, or you've got to put it somewhere that can host SCORM <coughs> content. Whereas with video, you've got so much flexibility, i.e., you've just said it, you can put it into your Storyline course. So you could create all this video content and drop it into Storyline and have that interactivity in Storyline, but you don't have to, and you can then host it on YouTube, you can host it on all these other platforms. So I think the point I was trying to make is that Video is a lot more flexible than tools like Storyline. YouTube was mentioned a lot, and I've built a whole framework, interactive framework around uh, the YouTube platform as well. And one of the concerns, and I don't know if it's a justified one, I've always had is what if YouTube changes his ad, the ad policy or the terms and condition or anything else with one goal? If you build around YouTube, all of that will be gone. Is that a, a valid concern or? Well, as far as I'm aware, you still own the content when you create content for YouTube. So you put your videos on YouTube. Um, yeah, if they, if they disappeared, you'd lose the description, you'd lose the subtitles, but you can't export the subtitles. So you technically could export it all onto a local environment. 
But you own the content, so if they disappeared or pulled your video off, you could just stick it somewhere else. That would be. I'm more concerned about them plugging ads in front of a video that shouldn't have ads. Oh, I see, yeah. Um, I think you can turn adverts off on your videos yeah. in YouTube. Yes, you can do it today. The oh. question is, what if it changes tomorrow? Is that a concern that you have? And it, was it boring to build, for example, your content around a second platform, like Vimeo you know, Pro or anything else? Yeah, well, of course. Vim you pay for it, it's always the <coughs> if you don't pay for a service. Yeah, yeah you're, you're right. If you choose something like Vimeo Pro or another really good one is Wistia. Anyone heard of that? That's a, a very business focused platform. It's like YouTube, but you pay for it. It's got um, no marketing, no advertising. They don't, you don't even see the Wistia logo on the videos. It looks like you're hosting itself. And it's got extremely powerful analytics. So you can see how much of your videos are being watched, whether they're you know, stopping at one, one part of the video and watching that same bit again a few times. Um, so yeah, you've, you've got that option. I mean, I, I guess I'm talking more at a budget level, but if you've got a, a, a bigger budget, you've got, much, you've got more advanced options so you're not at risk of, of that type of issue. I had um, thanks for the talk. Have either of you found a decent uh, substitute for Adobe After Effects in overlaying graphics on video? No, we, we, we use After Effects. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I, 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 I don't use After, After Effects myself. I recruit people who do because it's pretty, pretty hard to use. Uh, Hence the question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know off the top of my head, no. I know you can do basic kind of video editing in Photoshop, which sounds a bit bizarre, um, but I'm not sure how far into it you can get with that. And the tools I mentioned, the Powtoon and GoAnimate, they're pretty easy to use, but they're nowhere near as... Powtoon started doing it, it's, it's a bit clunky. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know anything else I don't think off the top of my head. Questions over this side of the room. I didn't want to ignore you. I'll be back to the other side as well. I just wanted to go back to the question around subtitling. And you mentioned that you could do it very easily. So like adding it to the video itself, um, what techniques do you use and what tools do you use? Well, you get the automatic ones as referred to by Ant, or you can create your own subtitle file, an SRT file, which is, is kind of like a notepad file. And there's software you can, you can just download, which is free. And you create this SRT file, which you then upload to your video, and then, the, then it automatically appears when it's played, when you, you, you have to select it or the language or what, but it, it, it's just like creating a notepad or a word file. Um, because the point about the automatic generation is good, but for, for, for us, we often have non-native English speakers doing the narration, and sometimes it's not so good at picking it up, so you sometimes have to go back to scratch and... and uh, but we have scripts. Okay. No, I mean, like, with the SRT file, the only time is you, ha you, 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 you have to do the time link as to when it appears, but it's, it's not a big problem. I'm sorry, what, what is the software for creating SRT files? Um, I, I, I believe if you just Google SRT, you'll, you'll just come up with a whole load of them. It, 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 there's a whole host of them, or you can even do it in Notepad. Hi, th thanks for the presentation. Question for Ant. Um, when you're developing software tutorials and things like that, is, do you have any tips for preventing it going out of date when there's a new release or an update? Yeah, I mean, I've actually just written a big article on my website on videobytes.co about script writing for software videos. And one of the things I mentioned in there is future proofing your script because th th there are little things that you can do. Now, obviously, um, for example, we had a so Nate sitting on the front row is, is basically helping me with all my development at the moment. And we had an incident last week where the client, we sent them this video and they said, oh, well, we've, we've moved the button from the top right to the top left. So can you fix it? Obviously we can, but if we, um, um, we thought ahead and when we wrote our script, we made sure we didn't put in things like, please move your arrow to the top right. We said, please click on login. Now, that means that we need to change the video, but we don't need to change the voiceover. So you, you still have to fix things and, and, and you know, change how it, how it, change it, basically, but you're, you're reducing the amount of workload. And I think, yeah, you, all, the thing about software is it's always gonna change, so you're always gonna have to tweak it and change it, and that's the great thing about software, it's, it's always gonna improve. Um, but trying to minimize 
what you're talking about in the voiceover to be as generic as possible. So if buttons move and features change, that you're not kind of having to redo the whole thing kind of thing. I don't know if that helps. Mm. Hello, thank you. Um, I'm just wondering regarding interactive videos, if you can give us maybe more tips on how long it should be, how many decisions points. Uh, do you think it can get a little bit confusing if you go towards, say, buying the drone rather than the other one and then they can't go back? I don't know, what's your view on that? Yeah, I, I, as I said, I'm not an expert with interactive video. The, there's a platform called H5P that I'm sure some of you have heard of, which is an interactive video platform. And I haven't used it myself, H5P. Uh, but they're kind of leading the way when it comes to interactive video. And I think it's, it's a bit like if you create a scenario in e-learning in general, you have to create a kind of tree, like a branching scenario. And you have to make sure that you think ahead. You're not obviously making the videos as you go. You're thinking ahead and you're um, deciding what's going to go into the story at what point. So, it's, I mean, that was just a silly example, obviously. But if you're creating something meaningful, it's about putting pieces into that scenario that are actually going to deliver value and make somebody think, oh, OK, I made the wrong decision, but it was a, a genuine decision. And then I think in that example, um, if you as well, if you want to see that example in full, you just go to YouTube. It was the top search result when, you, when I typed in interactive video, so you'll find it. Um, that actually takes you back to the, the table at some point. So you get to the point when you've run out of money, you have to pay the loan shark back, and he takes you back, and then you end up buying the cheaper thing because that's it, what you could afford. So. It, it can get very, very complicated. We overdid yeah. it. We were like above and beyond. We had good, bad, kind of bad, bad idea. Really, um, it really frustrated a lot. We even had a tip sheet at the end. Nobody wanted that, but what we ended up having to do is scrap the scenario and just give the right answer. People in the business environment that I was in, they weren't as academically decline, you know, inclined to want to learn for 40 minutes when they have like 14 hours of required learning. So I would take that into account. It, we did overdo it, and we should have made it more clear cut without you know, making it too easy, it was, it was too foggy. Matt, did you have something to add on that? We're just starting to look at it, and um, yeah, it's a little bit more complicated than we thought it was gonna be, so um, it's gonna take a bit more planning. But there's another good one you can have a look at called, uh, I think it's called Lifesaver, which, yeah, um, which, is, which is really, really good, and it, it's, um, it's, it's to do with um, a first aid. And that's, when I saw that, I was like, I wanna make that, but um, it's not proving to be so easy, so. Okay, so we're going to take one more question. Um, I'm going to ask Matt and Ant to kind of send you off with their word of advice or words of advice in regard to, you know, venturing into video and learning. And then I'm going to have an announcement at the end that we won't need to have to record, but I just wanted to give a heads up on that. Hi, um, I'm responsible for Salesforce training, and I've inherited just a series of screen captures. And I'm just wondering if you have any recommendations what I can do to these videos. We're adding voiceover, but is there a tool that I can jazz them up with? Because at the moment, they're very dull. Screen captures. I kind of do, if that helps. Go on, then, yeah. Um, we are doing the same thing. We're embedding it in Salesforce through a vendor um, approved apps. And it's video that's captured or tip cards or we're, we're mixing up the blend. But it comes up at the point of need. So if someone's putting in opportunities or they're putting in a particular product, it comes up. So that's been helpful. I think there's other ways that you can hook it in through um, anchors or things like that. But we're getting incredibly positive feedback. And we even had a, a gentleman from the UK tape it, do the audio over the Camtasia because it just sounded smarter, according to the North Americans. <laughs> so uh, that was really well received. It, we just kept it, but we kept it short. And it decreased our um, entries into the help desk by 44%. So that was 44,000 inquiries. We had 60,000, but 15,000 were like kind of. So it, it decreased it by 40%, which was helpful. OK. Um, gentlemen, words of advice sending folks off into the world of video and learning. Well, I mean, I guess I sort of said it. I would, but what I would do is really home in on your audience and what they need and, and really home in on the message that you're, that you're trying to get across. Um, 
I think with Andy, he's given you lots of different methods that you can sort of use. And, and I just go out there, have a go, and, and sort of have some fun doing it. But if you're buying equipment, don't rush out and buy expensive equipment before you know what it is that you're going to do. Work out what it is you're going to do, find the methods that work for you, and then you can sort of cut your cloth accordingly. And then you'll find that you'll become more experienced in what you're doing and you'll know what you need. Because we made a couple of bad sort of purchasing decisions at the very beginning, and we've just got some stuff now which is in a cupboard. So, um, so just to just take things slowly and, and have fun doing what you're doing. Yeah, I guess similar to Matt, um, just keep it simple. Um, I think, it, as I said at the beginning, it's easy to get distracted by the tools and all the technologies and, you know, obviously learning technologies. We're all interested in technology, but um, at the end of the day, you know, sitting and watching a five-minute video, it's still five minutes of somebody's life versus sitting and doing a five-minute storyline interaction or branch scenario or, or whatever it is, it's still five minutes. So you can still create that content with an iPhone and a, a lavalier microphone and it still can be high impact, high value without you know, spending thousands of pounds on production. So start simple and then you can, once you've proved the value, you can start investing more money in that area. Yeah, I have to agree with Ant. We just use a corporate iPad or the corporate iPhone. We can't use anything else. And sometimes, sometimes a studio, the reaction at a bank was that they kind of like that youtube -y, more natural uh, flow. So with that being said, thanks, guys. I have one announcement. Um, the whole program here wants to thank you guys for being so patient in regard to the issues with the Thames water. Um, they're hopeful that all that will be resolved tomorrow. Really? So many thanks by uh, the Learning Technologies Group. And thank you, gentlemen. That was outstanding. Thank you.